trials dark on every hand. We cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. Aren't you glad that we didn't give up? Aren't you glad that you didn't give up? Aren't you glad that God didn't give up on you? I need everybody in the house. Just to hit the rewind button on your life. And look at where you used to be. And see where God has you now. Then I want you to hit the forward button. And look where God is going to take you. Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. I'm talking about. It's bigger, bigger, bigger. We can't put God in a box. Where is it in Deuteronomy? It talks about digging ditches. God said, don't take a spoon to dig a ditch. Get you a bulldozer and dig some ditches so that God can fill your trenches. God wants to pour into you. He wants to overflow so that you have so much running over that you can share it with your neighbor here and there. God wants to bless you, but we're taking little bitty cups to God, asking God, just bless me. Bless me. And when we should be saying, That was a shouting point right there. If you want the blessings of God, don't ask for it. But ask, who wants them? I dare you to get up on your feet and say, God, just bless, enlarge my territory. Bless me, God. Open the windows of heaven. Bless me, God. He's doing it. He's doing it right now. I, let me see, can I make it a little plainer? I love football. Anybody else love football? I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. So for all you haters, we might not win the Super Bowl, but we, we have won it. <laughs> but there are two players on the field that I just really love. That's the quarterback and the wide receiver. They have what they call this timing play. The quarterback will get the ball hiked to him from the center. And he'll get that ball, and the wide receiver will run about 10 yards out, and then 10 yards down the field. Meanwhile, the quarterback, somebody like Kaepernick. The quarterback, a 
to throw the ball down the field. And by the time the ball gets to a certain point in the field, the wide receiver has time to play just so he can get there just in time. What am I trying to tell you, church? Get in place so that you can receive the blessings from God. God has something for you. You need to run down the field. You need to get in place and catch what God has for you. Right. Y'all stop showing out. <laughs> it's time to preach a sermon. <laughs> God is in the house. First lady, you, mm, you, you were right. Whatever happened yesterday has overflow. Overflow. <laughs> Reminds me when we used to go out on Friday night. It be so good on Friday night, it spill over into Saturday. There's a word from the Lord. <laughs> Bless God for the Macedonian Missionary Baptist Church and for the invitation and for allowing me to come and to share with you all today. Thank you for your pastor, my friend, my colleague, Dr. Henry. We are still praying for him, even though he went to Campbell and Gordon, Conwell. Praying for him. He needs a dip. <laughs> or two. <laughs> the Word of God coming from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Everybody got it? I didn't pull mine up. Oh, it's on the screen? All right. The Word says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers, when ever you experience various trials, right. knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. But endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature, complete, and lacking nothing. Matthew eleven twelve says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence and the violent have been seizing it by force. King James Version says, take it by force. Our theme and thought of meditation this morning is a rumble in the kingdom. I almost let go. I felt like giving up, but I didn't let go. Praise be to God for God's word. Send us your word, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, ushers. We have had trials tribulations since we have been created in the womb. Some of us have had tribulation even before we came out of the womb. But God still kept us. Portia Nelson wrote in her book entitled Autobiography of Five in five short chapters about her struggle in life. Chapter one, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in, I'm lost, I'm helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes me forever to find my way out. Chapter two, I walk down that same street, there's a deep hole in the sidewalk, I pretend I don't see it, I fall in again, I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it is my fault, and it takes me a long time to get out. Chapter three, I walk down that same street, there's a deep hole in the sidewalk, I see it there, I still fall in, now it's a habit. My eyes are open, I know where I am, it's my fault. I get out immediately. 
chapter 4, I walked down that very same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter 5, I walk down another street. We, we all have trials, tribulations that we go through, and some of those things we go through habitually because we keep doing the same thing and getting the same result. That's the definition of insanity. <laughs> we need to do something different. And when we do something different, we can get a different result. Things are just happening in our world that are crazy. We got gays and lesbians and supporters that have overturned the ethical law that marriage is between man and woman here in North Carolina. There are wars and rumors of wars. There's sanctions that have piled up all over. Number 45 is talking war to North Korea. Meanwhile, he's mean tweeting Steph Curry and LeBron James and knees are being taken in response to the violence dispersed upon black lives, white lives and blue lives, but considered disrespectful to patriotic to a freedom song that only meant freedom to a certain group. Meanwhile, liberty and justice for all is not for all. I ask you if the kingdom of God is suffering violence, the violent are taking it by force, who is the violent one? Is it the saints of God who realize that churches are not made from heaven, but we've got to go to hell and snatch people out for the kingdom of God? Or is it the crooks and the criminals of spiritual society trying to overtake God's house, God's people, and God's kingdom? Let me see, can we answer that question with this text? Where James begins, he's writing to the 12 tribes of Israel that are scattered abroad. And he gets to a point and he reminds us that we have a privilege. And that privilege, we should count it joy. In fact, we should rejoice in the fact that we can experience such concerns and situations that it would improve on our faith. Now, I know it sounds a little crazy, and I looked at James, and I, I said, James, you really want me to get excited because of the outward circumstances, the conflicts, the sufferings, and the trouble, the misery, the headaches, the hell, everything that I have been through and going to go through? You want me to consider it pure joy? Will you want me to take a gift that God has given me, and you want me to get excited because when I get the gift, the gift is all messed up, it's broken on the inside, it's mashed, it's crashed, it looks like mess, it smells like mess, it acts like mess, and I'm supposed to get excited because now I got all this mess in front of me, and I'm supposed to give God glory in the midst of the mess. Troubles, difficulties, I'm supposed to get excited in the midst of it all. Then James has the gall to tell us that don't try to get out of it too prematurely. <laughs> Stay in it. You know we want to flush it. We want to take that shower. We want to clean up. We want to get rid of it. We want things to be shiny and brand new. We don't want to be like gold, put into the fire, put into the fire, and put into the fire until the dross is clean and it comes out as pure gold. We don't want that. We just want it to be ready, set, go when we get it. When we get mess, we want to send it right back. I want my money back. I want a refund. Then you'd be like Jeremiah. God, you duped me. You fooled me. You tricked me. What, what were you doing, Lord? But God has a greater plan than what we could ever think or do. What does Romans 8 tell us? All things work together 
for the good and to those who are the called according to his purpose. So James reminds us, don't get out of it too prematurely so that you can be well developed and not deficient in any way. He reminds us if that if we know what we're doing, if we allow God to work on us and through us in all things, all things will make the difference in our lives. It might not look like much right now, but after a while, God is going to make it into something grand. What the devil may mean for bad, God can turn it around and use it for your good. Breakfast is good. Anybody likes breakfast? There's an egg that comes from the chicken. And then there's ham and bacon that comes from the pig. Am I right? Now, the doctor tells us don't mess with pork. But I'm here to tell you that ham and bacon is not pork. It's ham and bacon. <laughs> now, the chicken lays the egg for us. Amen? Bless God for the chicken. Because not only would the chicken lay the egg for us for breakfast, but at noontime and in the evening, he died so that we may eat fried chicken. But in laying the egg, the chicken didn't have to die. But now the pig, in order for us to have ham and bacon and pork chops and chitlins and all that stuff that we like, pig feet, pig ears, tongue, the brains, all that stuff, in order for us to have that, the pig has got to die. Sometimes some stuff has to die in our lives in order for us to be blessed. In order for us to receive the good things that God has in store, some things have got to die. That may mean relationships. Hello. It may mean some jobs, some situations, some concerns have got to go away in order for God to bless you. And God is working this thing out. He knows your struggles. He knows your difficulties. But he reminds us that bring everything to him because he cares for you. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. God gives us new mercies and new grace every day. And the Lord delivers us from all things. His compassions fail not. Many are the troubles of the righteous, but the Lord is able to deliver us from them all. The Lord reminds us that no good thing will he withhold from us to those who live uprightly. In fact, he will expand your territory. He will open up the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing that you don't have room enough to give. In fact, if you give the way you're supposed to give, God will give it back to you, good measure, pressed down, and running over. I dare you, I dare you to start giving things to God that you know you should have been given. I'm talking about the tithe and the offering. I'm not talking about just giving God that Baptist dollar that we give on Sunday morning. I'm talking about reaching deep into your wallet and giving that 10 of your gross uh, so that you can get a gross blessing. Let's get to the text. The text, text reminds us three important, three vital, three critical phases of expectation. He says, first, expect the rumble. Expect the trials to come. Expect the trouble to show up. Expect the popo to call your house. Expect the trouble to come. That's in verse 2. Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials. It's in the word. 
Secondly, he says, expect your faith to be tested, to be tested for endurability. It's a new word. I made it up. You can put it in your dictionary. We should be able to endure the trials that we go through. Now, understand this. Some things might take a day. Some things may take a week, a month, a year. But then there are some things that take a lifetime for God to bring you through. Lord, I've been waiting for 30 years, and it still hasn't come through yet. But when you get over, there is something wonderful for you. David said, yea, though I walk through the valley, didn't say I got to the valley and stayed there. But I, when I went through the valley, I found that God had some greater things on the other side. Expect the rumble, expect your faith to be tested. Thirdly, you got to expect to be in the rumble until it is complete, until you are mature, and until you have everything that you need from the rumble. You got to stay in the fire. Endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature, complete, and lacking nothing. You've got to be ready for anything and everything that life uh, will throw at you. You've got to hang in there. You've got to endure so that you can be mature for the life. This life will give us plenty of interruption, plenty of disruption, and plenty of corruption. Uh, so prepare yourself for the battle. Prepare yourself for the trials and the tribulations. The Bible tells us, think it not strange when we face the different trials that come for the strengthening of our faith. So it should not surprise you when the threat comes, when the challenge comes, when you're faced with the fight. Stop off not to scare you. Being broke ought not to scare you because you've been broke, busted, and disgusted before. Being alone ought not to frighten you because you've been there, done that, wrote the book on how to be alone. Frustration ought not to throw your whole life out of whack. Folks and things on your jobs and situations been getting on your nerves for years. Backsliding should not keep you in the faulty sin area, but you should get up, dust yourself off, and get back in the game. God says no weapon formed against you should prosper. All things work together for the good according to God's purpose. So the prayers of the righteous should avail much even in the midst of your tribe. It's going to come. The fight is going to come. It's, it's coming whether we like it or not. It's going to come like a thief in the night or it will come announced. We have the threats in front of us, so we need not be surprised. Oh, number 45 snuck up on us, didn't he? Kind of, sort of. But we should have thought. We should have known that the Shirley crowd surely was going to vote. But surely they did not. And now we've got what we've got. But no weapon formed against us will prosper. Let me see, can I put it in a little more perspective? You remember the saying, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee? Came from the man who was known as the greatest heavyweight boxer of the world. We called him Muhammad Ali, but his mama called him Cassius Clay. An American former boxer, three-time world heavyweight champion, nicknamed 
the greats. Ali was a bad dude. He was involved in several historic boxing matches. Notable among them were three with Joe Frazier and one which would be later called the Rumble in the Jungle with George Foreman. That fight happened more than some 30 plus years ago when Ali was just hours away from getting to the ring to challenge this undisputed heavyweight champion, George Foreman. Oh, I wish you could have seen the fight. Uh, the fight with Foreman represented more than just a chance for Ali to become the second former heavyweight champion, but it was a time for Ali to regain the title. So victory over Foreman meant validation and redemption for Ali. Ali, the challenger, came to the ring first, but Foreman took his time, hoping he would throw Ali off. But Ali used the extra time to get the crowd excited and worked up and to support him. So after keeping Ali waiting for about eight minutes, here comes Foreman storming out of the dressing room and jogging to the ring. And while the referee was giving the instructions, Ali began to talk junk to Foreman. He said, boy, you've been hearing about me since you were a boy in diapers, and now you've got to face me. Uh, you've got trouble uh, up ahead. Uh, so Foreman just glared back at Ali, and then both fighters went to their corners, and the bell rang, ding, ding, and all of a sudden, Ali comes out of his corner, and Foreman comes out of his corner, and in the first round, Ali was on top a foreman forcing him to fight and then foreman was on Ali hitting him with his quicker hands and beating foreman to the punch every once in a while so from about mid to second round Ali became more stationary fell back on the ropes and began to catch foreman's bombs on his shoulders and his uh, body and his arms and everything was happening all at once but what Ali found out that in those early rounds that if he would just stay back on those ropes and let Foreman do what he did and do what he does. And when he did it, he knew that after a while that payday would come off uh, after a while. Uh, so from round three to round seven, Foreman stalked Ali and tried to take his head off with every punch. And when Foreman had Ali on the ropes, he unloaded every punch uh, that he had. And while Ali was getting hammered, he began to talk to Foreman and say, is that all that you got? Uh, can't you hit me just a little harder? Come on, boy, I'm leaning back here waiting for you to take my head off. Uh, but Foreman was just about spent. Uh, so by the time he got to the eighth round, uh, Ali caught uh, an overextended Foreman with a left right, uh, followed by a stinging one, two, uh, and a last punch uh, sent Foreman to the canvas. Uh, Foreman missed the count, uh, but he stayed there, uh, and the judge said that Ali, uh, you are now the heavyweight champion. Uh, God was doing something uh, with Ali. Uh, he thought that it was deemed possible uh, that by every respect, uh, that every boxer should know uh, that he is the winner. Uh, however, Macedonia, uh, I come by here in Wilmington, uh, North Carolina, uh, just to let you know uh, that there was a greater fight uh, more than 2,000 uh, years ago. <laughs> it took place uh, on a hill uh, called Calvary uh, in a desert jungle uh, instead of eight long rounds uh, it took uh, just three uh, Ali was well known uh, for his great fight uh, called the rope -a dope uh, where he leaned back uh, on the ropes uh, but I let you know uh, that Jesus Christ uh, perfected the rope -a dope uh, even before uh, there was an Ali <laughs> So the boxer can lean back against the rope and take the hits. Jesus said, let me show you how to do it. So Jesus made the rope-a-dope famous 
uh, long before there was uh, a Cassius Clay. Uh, Jesus said, uh, you can't kill me, but I'll lay down uh, my life. Uh, so just like Ali, uh, Jesus uh, was taking the beatings, uh, hit uh, after hit uh, after hit. Uh, but what the enemy doesn't know, uh, that when Jesus uh, was taking the hits, uh, he was waiting uh, for the right moment, uh, time not yet revealing uh, his next move. Uh, Jesus was sentenced to death uh, in the ring by crucifixion. Uh, in fact, uh, he was kissed uh, on the cheek uh, for 30 pieces of silver, uh, hit uh, by hit. Uh, uh, they put a crown of thorns on his head. Uh, they put a robe on his back uh, and a scepter in his hand. Uh, Jesus was taken, uh, hit uh, by hit. Uh, oh, Jesus uh, was tried and convicted uh, of a crime that he didn't commit. Uh, so Jesus took uh, hit uh, after hit, uh, Jesus leaned uh, on the ropes. Uh, in fact, he leaned uh, not to his own understanding, uh, but in all his ways, uh, he acknowledged him uh, who he knew uh, would come to send help. Uh, after a while, uh, I think that Jesus uh, leaned on the ropes, uh, looked to the hills uh, from which cometh his help, uh, cause his help comes uh, from the Lord. They beat him and they whipped him beyond recognition. They put nails in his hands, nails in his feet. They hung him high and stretched him wide. In fact, he hung from the sixth to the ninth hour. And folks thought that Jesus had taken a dive. He stayed down and the referee said one on Friday night. He stayed down and the referee said to her on Saturday night, but early, early Sunday morning, Jesus got up with all power in his hand. Power, power in his hand. The Jesus was not down. He was not knocked out. In fact, he is still alive. What am I trying to tell you, church? Get ready for the battle. You got to stand and take your stance. For God says the enemy is going to come in like a flood. But get ready. Get ready. How many sanctified boxers do I have in the house? I dare you. Get on your feet. Get in your place. Get your stance, bob and weave, bob and weave, punch, jab, uppercuts, give it to the enemy, cause God says, you've got the victory, you've got the victory, let's get ready, get ready, get ready to rumble, cause God says, you are a winner, you are a victor, you can have what God says you can have. You can do what God says you can do because you've got Jesus. Anybody glad they got Jesus? He'll do it. He'll do it. Anybody glad? 